Hello everyone, Pastor George here, and today we are going to continue with our Heretics and Heterodox series, and we are moving out of heresy back into what I consider Christianity, although the church in the Middle Ages did not, at least the mainstream power control of the church. So something you should know is that during the Middle Ages, there was a lot of internal debate and reform movement that was generally made, so people um, could kind of fight back with, against what they saw to be the excesses of the established church, right? And these people would come up, and sometimes they would be uh, grafted on, and sometimes they would be kicked out. It kind of depended on a lot of factors. Sometimes it just came down to who you were related to physically. Uh, sometimes it came down to whether or not you had military power or uh, lots of followers or stuff like that. So, for instance... Francis, St. Francis, Francis Assisi, uh, Franciscans, all these things I'm sure maybe you've heard of before, like Catholic schools that are Franciscan or something like that. He was very much disliked by the church in power when he went through and tried to reform the movement, but he made a lot of followers. And unfortunately, they wanted, in many cases, to declare him to be a heretic, but they couldn't, especially because he really preached against worldly possessions and stuff like that, which the church obviously is a land-holding unit, didn't really like all that much sometimes. So there was, there was those type of people, and then there were people who were less lucky because they happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, or in the case of one of them, trusted the wrong people. And we're going to talk about what are called the, the morning stars of the Reformation. Now, a morning star is something that is you know, a star that you see in the morning that kind of shows that the sun is going to come up soon, right? So these guys are considered the two precursors to the Reformation. If you want to call them early reformers, that's that's all right too, right? Um, and so they're around in the late 1300s, early 1400s, and it's two Johns. John is a very popular name, always has been. The first one is a guy by the name of John Wycliffe, and the second is the name of a guy named Jan Hus, or John Hus, who's from uh, today what would be the Czech Republic, or Czechia. And so they uh, are both uh, kind of active in the late Middle Ages, right before the Renaissance. And the thing that you have to know is at this point, people are starting to chafe under the pressures of the uh, church in power. The Black Plague had just swept through Europe, and so a lot of people are kind of questioning the, uh, the society that they're in, right? That's what these big things tend to do, kind of like COVID is now. People are asking a lot more questions about the society that we're living in, um, and it's no different back then. I mean, imagine COVID, but imagine it actually way worse, right? That's that's the Black Death. And so people are uh, reacting to this, and they start to look at the Bible, and they start to go, I didn't know any of this stuff was in here. Um, and people who take it very seriously are starting to translate it into the modern languages at the time. So the earliest English translation comes from John Wycliffe, right? And you can go read it. It's online. It's you know, if maybe if you've gotten some you know training or whatever, you can read it. Uh, maybe if you look at famous passages, you can kind of make out what's there. But it is it does sound extremely different. It's spelled very strangely than than modern English, so um, it's not quite readable for us. It's just a little too old uh, for us to understand. But for the people then, they could understand it. And he was active in England, and he made a bunch of enemies, but he never actually was declared a heretic within his lifetime. After he died, he and his followers were declared heretics and they were burnt at the stake. And I believe that they did dig up his body and burn it at the stake and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, so you kind of got the early movement there and drove them underground, right? But they never really went underground. People would notice that when the Reformation reached England later in the 1500s, there were a lot of people who were secretly Wallards. That was the name of his followers, Wallards. And they uh, would come up again at that time to kind of help the Reformation come along. Now, you jump forward a couple decades and you go to the Czech Republic, what would today be the Czech Republic, and you have Jan Hus, who's translating the Bible into the Czech language for the first time. And he is interacting with all these different scholars, and he is calling out the excesses of the church. And then the, he is invited to a trial where he uh, can defend his beliefs before a council and show them the, the error of their ways, right? The church makes him this offer. 
And Jan Hus believes them, and he goes, and they do give him a trial. It's not much of one. He's barely allowed to speak, and then they take him and they burn him at the stake, right? Um, and his followers would go on to actually make up a big chunk of the Czech population, and in fact, they would call crusades uh, against them, and uh, the Hussites would win, and they're there at the time of the Reformation kind of doing their own thing. And uh, they eventually team up with what would be kind of the Lutheran uh, church and help uh, to, to start the Reformation. Um, the reason these two people are important is because it shows that we already have these movements, right? And that the church is getting really antsy about, uh, or picky and choosy about who can be a heretic and who isn't. Not so much based on really deep doctrinal differences, but really who's challenging the power, right? And so you have uh, this happening. Martin Luther would learn from both of these people, especially Jan Hus, that you cannot trust the church to actually give you a fair trial uh, because they're just going to burn you at the stake. And so what he would do is he would insist on having a secular trial uh, at the court of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, which he would go, and that's where he has his famous speech, and, and we could get to Martin Luther next week. But he, uh, but, but, but he learns from that, and because of that, he doesn't get burned at the stake. He stays alive. His ideas continue to spread, which is why he's con considered like the real starting point of the Reformation in a historical sense. So that's a little bit of history for you. But I just wanted to show that her heresy is should be, for us, just relegated to really deep doctrinal differences with biblical Christianity. Um, a lot of people end up in this time just declaring as heretics people they don't like, despite not really having a strong scriptural basis to do so. So we should also resist that temptation. All right, everyone, I will see you guys tomorrow, um, Christmas Eve, uh, and uh, for either a in-person service or an out -person, outside person service. Still looks like it's going to rain, so it's probably going to be inside. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, you guys won't be inside, but you'll be watching it online. Um, and I'll see you, you know, uh, on theologues and stuff like that. So everyone have a wonderful day. Peace out.